Brother Tenicio, how are you today? Hey, excellent, excellent. Good, 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 good. I uh, just want to welcome you to the 18th annual Happening Natural Day. Welcome to the space, my brother. Yes, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I'm thankful for you to be here, man. It's a uh, it's good vibes. Uh, we've been really rolling, man. Uh, brother Aris gave a really stellar presentation on how to make an onk cake. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we've been blessed by my brother, Michael Carter, Sister Leah. Uh, it's just been an amazing ride uh, uh, today with the, even with the techno technological shifts we had to apply in order to make this happen. So I'm thankful for you being able to be here. Um, I, I, before we start, I just want to give a little brief introduction to you, you know, just uh, let people know, you know, our relationship. I've known Brother Tanisio at least has been at least eight years. I think when we first came down to Happy Natural Day, when I first met your acquaintance. Correct. Uh, the work that you have been doing with uh, Brother Kashan Myers out of Habershaw was striking and very, uh, very powerful to me. It was very inspirational, to be honest. And so I had just kind of like, you know, watched, you know, as you evolved in that space and how you, you know, started doing the aggregation of produce mm -hmm. from local farmers, you know, and how you as a farmer yourself, you know what I mean, evolved your practice. And, you know, now seeing Nature Candy Farms doing garden consulting and installation while, you know, all the other things that you got going on, I'm presuming, um, has, all, has always been fascinating. And I've, all, I've referenced it many a time when I talk to people about the opportunities that come with urban agriculture. That is, this ain't nothing that nobody just going to hand you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's going to be some work that you got to do but it's fruitful if you can figure out the system for yourself and what, what makes it work. I remember we brought you down to uh, uh, the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. You were an right. amazing presentation. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I count you and Kishan and Ross Kofi and others as very uh, instrumental in my own uh, kind of like catalyst, cat catalyzation into this work and, and, and seeing y'all and being like, yo, I see what they doing. Yeah, there's no reason why I can't be doing this out here. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. thank you for being, you know, uh, dedicated and disciplined, you know, in that work and doing, uh, you know, everything else that you do, but most definitely, you know, centered around the Urban Mag. So uh, Tanisio is the founder, uh, owner of Nature Candies Farms. I, I know you work with a bunch of other people, but I don't know if you want to highlight them. <laughs> I mean, I'd be remiss not to, you know, shout out to uh, Habesha, where I got my start, you know, we'll say unofficially around 2006, but then officially 2011 when I went through the Habesha Works program. Shout out to Baba Rashid Nuri with Truly Living Well. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I've worked at Georgia Organics, the common market, uh, worked indirectly with organizations such as Global Growers, a lot of people that I've, I've done this work with Foodwell Alliance, City of East Point, you name it. So yeah. uh, I'd be remiss to not, you know, include all of those organizations and or names because they make up who I am. But of course, I definitely would be remiss not to give reverence to uh, Augusta Long, uh, mm -hmm. who is my great grandfather, uh, the individual who was able to preserve the land that we had in our family starting in 1882 in Gauss, Texas, wow. and pass that land along to this day. Wow. Uh, so we are centurion landowners, and I'm proud to say that we've had this land in our family uh, going on close to, I guess that's uh, 138 years now uh, as Black landowners uh, in Texas of all places. So Nice. nice. So, so um, you know, I'm, I'm going to let you, you know what I'm saying? I know you, you, you talked about the presentation today uh, being about the myths of what's organic and um, I, I'm presuming that you might have a, pre, a PowerPoint or some sort. I, of I have a presentation, yeah. So do you need to give me, I guess, screen yeah, I, sharing? I, I, this? Go ahead and give it a shot. See if it works out. Let's you, see uh, if it works now. Uh, it's not working out? No, I said I'm going to see if it does work now. Let's see. Can you see my screen? Yep, I sure can. Okay, terrific. Well, I guess I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's go. <laughs> and this will be a very interactive presentation. So for all you out there in social media world, get ready. Definitely take some notes. I'm also going to actually have you do an activity where you may need your computer or cell phone. So uh, you'll have a few minutes to get that squared away as I give this intro. 
Uh, but again, give thanks. My name is Tenisio Natana Sayanima of Nature's Candy Farms. Uh, I have been in this urban ag work now, uh, like I say, officially uh, since about 2011 when I first went through the Habesha Works program and then uh, began my own little small garden in the backyard, which eventually grew to become its actual uh, uh, manifestation as today, a, a farm, if you will, an urban farm. Um, but I'd be remiss to also not include some of the ancestors who paid this work. Uh, so since there's no elders necessarily on this uh, uh, medium to give me permission, I'm gonna take it from this elder right here uh, who I had a chance to uh, frequently speak with uh, in some of his latter years, that being uh, Baba Ralph Page, who was the former executive director of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. I'll let you Google his name if you're not already familiar with him, but trust me when I say, uh, this was one of our freedom fighters. He was someone who pulled no punches, uh, and he was actually one of the individuals who uh, was involved in helping uh, right the wrongs uh, that were written at that time and, 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 and uh, shall we say rectified at that time within the USDA as related to their uh, treatment of black agrarians. Uh, for any of you all out there who are farmers and you've heard of the program OAO, uh, the Office of uh, Advocacy and Outreach, uh, We'll say for all practical purposes, that was the efforts of Baba Ralph Page and the Federation of Southern Cooperatives bringing that into fold. Um, and so many of the cost share incentives that we get as black growers, the 90% above the 75%, if you go through the Natural Resource Conservation Service, that comes directly from people like him. Mm. Uh, so I definitely give a big ashe to Baba Ralph Page and the leadership that he did uh, down here in the state of Georgia uh, via that national organization. Also want to give reverence and respect to Mama Jessica Gordon Neimbard for uh, encapsulating our history of cooperative economic thought in her book known as Collective Courage. So if you haven't had a chance to pick up that publication, that's definitely one uh, that I feel is essential to include uh, in your arsenal, if you will, in this war uh, to really regain self-sufficiency uh, as Black landowners and agrarians as well. And uh, with that being said, I'm gonna start off with a quick quiz. So I'm actually gonna shrink this screen down and this is where you're gonna need to make sure you have access to a cell phone, a computer. Hopefully some people participate. Uh, so if you don't, I guess I'm just gonna be out here answering their questions by myself. But I want you all to go on to this website right here, pollev.com, that's P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash green temple 462 i got a nice care package of some certified organic seeds and uh maybe some other gifts for the winner of this quiz so hopefully that'll inspire you to take it i'm gonna give you all about another 60 seconds to get logged on that's pollev.com we're gonna see who really knows about their gmos who really knows about certified organic food and uh hopefully you know i don't have to do a presentation hopefully y'all ace this test and we can just build but if we get any answers wrong, then that means I got to go to work and, and, and provide some support and education for the community. So about 30 more seconds, pollev.com forward slash green temple 462. Count down in 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, Four, three, two, one. All right, y'all. Let's see who's ready. Hopefully we got some participation. So like I said, this quiz is just a little primer to go into the presentation so we can see what you all knew before the presentation and thus after. So it's called, What Do You Know About GMOs and Certified Organic Food? And we're gonna actually be able to see who's getting answers right and wrong. Not necessarily your name, but just the percentages of people getting the answers right or wrong. So first question is, is there such a thing as GMO salt? And so now there's countdowns on these questions that are actually happening here. And so let's see who gets the answer correctly. You got 30 seconds to answer it. 30 seconds, is there such a thing as GMO salt? 16 seconds. I don't know. I don't see no answers. It might just be you and me manifest answering this one. Let's see. Let's see what you come up with. And you can read it out if you didn't log in. I, 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 I see some people over here responding. We'll see what we got. 
<laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Maybe they did. Maybe I'm just not seeing them come up yet. Let's see. All right, let's go to the next screen here. Uh, poll lot. There we go. Okay, there are some people. Boom, dope. All right, so 60% of you all said yes, and 40% of you all said no. Whoever said no, you are correct. <laughs> Whoever said no, oh, you are right. correct. So, so leaderboard is, is uh, yeah, we got some folks on the leaderboard here. Let's see if we can get the rest of y'all on, on, on some points. Choose as many of these commercially available crops that you think are GMO. So I'm gonna give you a list and you gotta pick the ones that you think are actually GMOs. There's your list. You got 30 seconds to pick the ones you believe are actually genetically modified organisms. Mm. So you can pick more than one. Five seconds. All right, here we go. It wouldn't let me choose more than one, but I definitely. I, uh, <laughs> oh, really? Okay, I might have needed to change the setting. That might have been my mistake then. Uh, if I did. I, I got one right though. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll just say this much. You're going to learn which ones are actually genetically modified in the presentation. So, however, the points fell, we'll just let that be. Uh, USDA certified organic standards prohibit artificial coloring, flavoring, and preservatives. Yes or no? True or false? Does the USDA certified organic standards prohibit artificial coloring, flavoring, and preservatives? Meaning, does it not allow it? So if you went to buy something off the shelf and it said it was certified organic standards, the question is, do those standards allow artificial coloring, flavor, or preservatives? And in three seconds, we're going to see who knew the answer. So, ah, we've got everyone who said uh, no. And you know what? I think I may, have, you know what, manifest, no lie, I put this together five minutes before the presentation. And uh, so I may have messed up on that answer there. It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but the actuality is, uh, no, it does not allow it. And I see I had it checked off as yes, so that was wrong on me. So the answer is no, it does not allow it. So all of you all who said no, you actually were right. That's it. But it looks like that wouldn't have changed the leaderboard because everyone said no. So that's how I can get out of that and not get tomatoes thrown at me. Uh, <laughs> next one, pesticide use in agriculture has gone up over the last 40 years. Yes or no? I think this one should be pretty easy, if not at least intuitive for most of you all to figure out. Has pesticide use gone up in agriculture or has it gone down in the last 40 years? And hopefully I didn't mess up on checking off the right answer on this one. <clears throat> Appreciate you all participating. I hope this is, you know, educational even in itself so far, because we're going to go into these subjects deeper here in a moment. So the answer is yes, and 100% of y'all got it. Big ups, that's what I like to see. You know what I mean? Some just awareness, right? So the leaderboard is uh, starting to change a little bit here. Next question, USDA certified organic products are accredited, and there's an ellipsis after that, so that means you gotta fill in the blanks of the sentences. Are they accredited annually, biannually, or triannually, meaning every year? every two years or every three years, do you have to go back to get your products accredited? Meaning, do you have to bring a certifier to your establishment to say you're on point with our standards or not? Yearly, biannually, or triannually? How often do you have to get accredited? Three, two, one, and the answer is annually. So it looks like 50% of you all got that right. Let's see what's happening on the leaderboard. Uh-oh. I yeah. see somebody's pulling away here. <laughs> but that's a little tight race. I shouldn't say pulling away. It's tight. Next question. There is such a thing as GMO water. True or false? There's such a thing as genetically modified water. Uh, well, it's starting to feel like an episode of Soylent Green. If y'all ain't seen that movie before... <laughs> 
you know, go go peep game about what they were talking about in the 1970s about the food supply and where we would end up in the future. So is there such a thing as GMO water? We're going to find out in five seconds. In fact, everyone's answered. So we can go ahead and move forward. Poll is locked. And the answer is false. Good job, everyone. That's what I'm talking about. I've seen a lot of truths, though. A lot, of, you know, a lot of healthy skeptics out there. I ain't mad at them. They done made everything else, right? Shoot, they got melanin on the size of the spaceship, so why can't they genetically modify some water, right? Well, they haven't done it just yet, or at least they haven't offered it to us. Let's just say that. Uh, but actually, you can't do it, and we're going to get into that in the presentation. So all USDA certified organic product, grains, meats, and processed foods do not allow the use of GMOs. So the question is, are you allowed to use GMOs when you're making a certified organic product? Yes or no? Well, so in this case, let me make sure I don't confuse the question. All USDA certified organic products, grains and meats and processed foods do not allow the use of GMOs. Yes. Probably should have made that maybe a true or false, but either way, it's the same thing. Hopefully it's interpreted correctly. So the answer is no, you cannot use GMOs within there. However, uh, oh wait, no, excuse me. The answer is yes, they do not allow the use of those uh, products in there. I think I'm just confusing myself even reading it back. So no, you, they, they do not allow it. And so uh, starting to get even here, certified or naturally grown crops are certified by a third party accreditor, meaning if it's me and my brother manifest. Is there one more extra person in between me? I'll be the USDA. I'll be the purported bad guy today. Manifest is the farmer. Does there need to be a third party in between us to do the accreditation for me to get certified naturally grown, which is its own certification? Let's see how many people know this one. So this isn't certified organic. This is another certification called certified naturally grown in the farming community. We call it C and G. You know. In seconds, looks like everyone's answered. Let's see if it lets me advance. It does. Okay. So 40% of y'all got it right, which is the answer is no. And uh oh. Starting oh. to see some, some switching here. Let's, let's, hey, this is, this is a nice race to the end. USDA certified organic product is more nutritious than conventional produce. Now I'm just gonna put a disclaimer based upon popular opinion. So this is kind of a devil's advocacy question. I guess I've kind of given my position on it, but playing devil's advocate, USDA certified organic product is more nutritious than conventional produce. What do you think? You got to put the, you got to put the hat on. Uh, you know, play devil's advocacy to answer this one. Right here, sir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you see, I got my tan on, so it's clear that I ain't faking the funk. You know what I mean? But hey, you know, we'll purge it out of us as soon as the question is over. You know, we'll do a big ashe and get it on up out of us. Shake the devil off, as our brother. <laughs> right, right. It was a big crit, shake the devil off. That's it. All right, so the answer is false. According to, we'll leave it there. <laughs> I, ain't even gonna, I ain't even gonna give no more energy to it. I seedless fruit. This game, right? See, see, well, I don't know now. Let's see. Seedless <laughs> fruit is genetically modified. Let's see if you know this one. Seedless fruit is genetically modified. True or false? False. I already know there's going to be some splits in this one. That's just, I've been doing this too long. If there's not, and they're all right, hey, then we got we got a smart crowd here. But I think this is one of those that really, you know, we 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 got we to gotta dive deep into it. Seedless fruit is genetically modified. Five people have answered and only one person, I think, I think, yeah, because we have five people, yeah, that's 20%. Only one person said false. I told you, Manifest. See, that's the one right there. That's, that's the question right there. 
Seedless fruits are made by what method? Let's see who's good at test taking now. <laughs> Let's see who's good at test taking. Seedless fruits are made by what method? You know, I'm just messing with y'all. You know, this is this is definitely again, we, we ain't here to pick on no one. This is why we need this information because it's about being an educated producer, an educated consumer. It's too much uh mystery out there, right? So good. We got some good test takers. Nobody said genetic modification, obviously, because we already talked about that in the last question. However, people did say hybridization. Yet yeah, another one of those right? Kind of terms that do we really know what it means? So the answer is stenospermarcopy and uh, parthenocarpy. Try and say those two times, forget three in a row. Those are some big scientific words, right? And I think this is the last one. How many commercially available GMOs exist in the marketplace? The hint is commercially available. That's the hint. I gave you the key word, that's the only hint you get. How many commercially available GMOs exist in the marketplace as of right now, 2020? April, what is this, 29th, 28th? Yeah. Let's see who knows it. I don't know, that's a good question. I, that, this one, I'm mm -hmm. Come on, whoever that last person is, make a decision. Come on, you can get it. All right. Well, the answer is 10. It's 10 commercially available GMO products. So now that's important to know because, and I guess I'll be giving a little bit of a leak into the presentation. You know, there's all this talk about GMOs. The fact of the matter is there's only a few products compared to what's out there that are GMOs, but they're in everything. There's a lot of stuff there. So that's the key is you have to understand how dense these 10 products are in all the food that's available. And so with that being said, yeah, I don't know, D, am I supposed to give it to you or second place, man? What you want to do? He, he, he is technically the, 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 the founder, so I'm going to do this. You, my brother, I'm going to send you a pack and I'm going to send the second person a pack. In fact, to be honest, I'm sending everyone a pack. It's, it's it's all love. I just wanted to have some fun before we get into this, you know, deep information. We just wanted to have a little bit of joy and fun with this. So to get your pack, you need to email me, naturescandyfarms at gmail.com. N-A-T-U-R-E-S-C-A-N-D-Y-F-A-R-M-S at gmail.com. Now here's what you need to be careful of. It's real information. You know, these Chinese manufacturers have been sending seeds out to people uh, mysteriously. So don't get my packet confused with theirs. I'm being very real here, y'all. There's been seeds showing up to people's homes mysteriously. Peep the news on that. Go, go look it up. Um, so I'll make sure that my package is one that you can definitely recognize it comes from me. It'll say Nature's Candy Farms on it. But big ups, y'all. That was dope. Let's go ahead and get into the presentation. And I hope that was nice and fun for you all, because like I said, now we're going to get to some serious stuff. Nothing too doom and gloom, though, believe it or not. So first, let's start with those 10 commercially available crops. Here they are, live and in effect, right in front of you. As of 1995, that was yellow squash that was introduced into the marketplace. That was the first one. Then cotton in 1996. Soybeans as well in 1995. Corn in 1996. Papaya in 1997. All y'all, you know, uh, papaya lovers, my people from the Caribbean, my people who love trail mix, that papaya that's in there is most likely GMO. Alfalfa in 2006, that's a horse feed and it's also used in, our, uh, in uh, farm production. Sugar beets, not to be confused with the beets that you typically buy for regular consumption, but these are used to process sugar. Canola, which is used to make what? Canola oil, that's a GMO. There's certain varieties of potatoes that were introduced in 2016, and there's certain variety of apples that were uh, introduced in 2017. Here's some of the characteristics behind those particular crops, and this tells you why they began to make genetic modified versions of them. Um, this is where now plant science 
begins to compete with the principles. Now, I don't know if y'all can read this. If it's too small, I'll just read off a few. But ultimately, uh, let's take, for example, the apples. It says it's genetic traits is uh, that by making a genetically modified version of it, it prevents it from browning. So I used to work in the food distribution world. And what uh, I know is that, well, I still work in that world. What I know is that uh, when I worked in a warehouse doing this, you know, when apples come in just from the weight of the apples in a box, the moving them from pallet to floor, you name it, shaking around in the back of a truck, that bruises a lot of that product. And so you don't want to be the buyer of that product and it show up at your location and now half of your inventory is spoiled. So they've now genetically modified traits into many apple varieties to prevent them from browning. But see, now that's a conflict between capitalism and, you know, uh, agrarianism, if you will, and just, you know, true uh, uh, sustainable agriculture, you know, uh, a, a permaculture relationship with the earth. That's a conflict. However, it exists in the commercial market. And so another thing I can do is also for those of you all who request by email, I can send this presentation to you and then you could take a deeper dive into why those 10 crops all have. Uh, genetically modified traits. But continuing on, uh, we asked that question about genetically modified salt at the beginning, and the answer is no, there's no such thing. And why is that? It's because salt does not have a genetic structure, all right? Salt is a mineral, right? It's not something that has gene, a gene pool. So there is no such thing as GMO salt. So for those who get paranoid when they see things such as like Himalayan pink salt, that's the natural color of that salt. In fact, there are pink salt water sources throughout the globe, one of which is even located uh, in Senegal, West Africa. Um, so just know that not everything that may be newly introduced to the marketplace that looks unfamiliar to you because you haven't seen it before, uh, looks that way just because of some type of scientific experiment. In many cases, this is where we've been limited in our access to the market and to the products that are on the market. And when we get exposed, we have to get educated about what we're being exposed to. Just to move through some of these slides, they're really just a part of a fuller presentation that I give. But now let's talk about seedless varieties of crops. Let's take seedless grapes, for example. Many people believe that seedless products are genetically modified. They are not. Now, let me make sure I'm clear with you all when I say this. That doesn't mean that I'm saying that if the method is not genetic modification, that other methods are ones that I endorse. I'm not here to endorse really any method or not. I can tell you for a fact, I am a sustainable grower. I'm an organic grower. So that tells you how I do things. Um, however, it's not to say that if genetic modification uh, is not used, that all other methods are good because they could be questionable as well. I leave that up for you to decide and form an opinion around. But with that being said, Genetic modification is not used typically in seedless production. What is used is a form of science known as permarcopy. And you have stenospermarcopy, and you also have parthenarcopy. Basically, the quickest way to explain that is it's almost like the process of replicating sterility, all right? There are times within the plant's growth in which you can actually, uh, let's say, for example, take the uh, pistol from a flower right before it's getting ready to produce seed and remove it so that when it produces uh, its flower, it produces its fruit, excuse me, that fruit can be produced without a seed within it, right? Now, if you wanna perpetuate that process, then that means you have to always come back to that plant species and manipulate it. Genetic modification is where you're literally going into the gene pool of that plant and manipulating it. And that's a little bit of a different science. But if you want to nerd out and learn more about these type of sciences, uh, I found good videos on YouTube that express it concisely. And again, I have this right up here for those who would love to receive this presentation. Now, what's the difference between some logos? That's what we're really going to get into now, because this logo issue that we have going on uh, is really confusing to people. There's a lot of things that almost come off redundant. You don't know if you see one logo, if that means, okay, the product's good or bad, and you don't know how to really sift through all this. So we're going to hopefully break up some of that confusion right now. And the main two are the USDA's organic certification and the non-GMO project verified logo. 
first and foremost, here's a quick, concise way to look at it. If you all see this chart here, this is the breakdown. And if you can't see it, I'll read it out. First and foremost, the USDA certified organic certification and the non-GMO project both have the same three things in common. They have a verification that's maintained. Uh, we'll say that it's a trustworthy way to avoid GMOs and both prevent, uh, excuse, yeah, prevent, prohibit GMOs in all aspects of farming and processing. So that's very important to know. If you buy something that's USDA certified organic based upon their standards, based upon their uh, certification system, there should not be genetically modified organisms in there. Now, if you feel like ah, I still got a healthy skepticism about that, you can always go to the USDA through its organic integrity database. So if you Google the organic integrity database, and let's say, for example, you bought a product and you're like, you know what, I just don't know for sure. You can actually go to that database and it'll give you the breakdown of when the business that creates that product got certified. You can go and then talk to the certifier themselves, ask them to show you the organic system plan that that uh, company went through. And if you really want to get into the details of it, you can look and see what products were actually authorized within their production system. That's how you could nerd out and know this stuff. However, if you just want to have enough faith in the government, as they say, then this is one of the ways you can do it. And the non-GMO project uh, does the same, except they themselves are a for-profit, uh, excuse me, non-for-profit entity, not a government entity. Now, here's where some of the differences are in the two. The non-GMO project uh, tests for GMO residue at multiple levels of production. Now, why it says it does that and USDA certified organic does not is because the non-GMO project actually deals only with processed goods. You will not see the non-GMO project logo in any shape or form on a raw good. You will see raw goods with either the USDA certified organic logo or the PLU code associated with that certification on raw goods, meaning you can go to the produce aisle and get a certified organic banana and its PLU code will be 94011. If you wanna get a non-organic banana, it'll just be 4011. Now, you can't go to that same product and see a non-GMO project logo on there. But here's where you reduce some of the redundancy. You don't need to see that logo because USDA has already uh, verified that GMOs are not in that product along with all the other standards. However, if that certified organic banana is now processed into a banana chip, there's other things that go into creating that product. It could be some palm oil. It could be some salt. Uh, it could be some citric acid or just some other additive. The multiple tests for GMO residue come in when you now have to see if those other additives are also genetically modified. So that's the key difference is that non-GMO project works on processed foods exclusively, while the USDA certified organic works on the entire loop. Now, but again, USDA works on the entire loop by way of the raw goods. So next, here's all the things that the USDA certified organic provides on top of that. They prohibit the use of chemical synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. They prohibit antibiotic and synthetic hormone use for animals pr produced, meaning goats, sheep, pigs, you name it, chickens. It's regulated by federal law, which is that third party. So when we talked about is there a third party that has to come in in the certified naturally grown world, they don't have that, but in the USDA certified organic world, they do. Uh, and last but not least, or the last two, I should say, the USDA prohibits artificial coloring, flavoring and preservatives, and they require all animals that are produced to eat organic feed and pasture. Not only do they require that, it has to be done no later than day two of the birth of that animal. So if let's say, for example, you have a chicken farm and you raise chickens by day two, there can no longer be anything done to that animal that violates the USDA certified organic standards. So day one is all you really got before you have to now get with the program. This is important not only for my producers who may be listening, but also for you as consumers to know. And so again, there's more detail in the specifics of these. If you'd like to look through it again, just hit me up. I'll send you the presentation. I'm actually cruising through this pretty quickly. So we're going to open it up even for questions if necessary. Next, I want to talk about the environmental working group. 
because the Environmental Working Group has put together a list uh, known as the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. Many of you all may have learned of it over the years. If you haven't, and this is your first introduction to it, well then welcome to the club. Uh, what this allows you to do is determine if, if a product is not certified organic, you know, you may still have concerns, but some of those concerns can be lessened if you know how that product has to be produced even in a conventional setting. And so you have certain products that if they're produced conventionally, they are very dirty as the EWG calls it, meaning they have high usage of pesticide residue. Um, as you see, in this case, anything that's at the top of the list is high in that usage. So if you were to buy strawberries conventionally, in 2017, when I uh, put this presentation together, they were ranked high on the list. And I can tell you still in 2020, they're probably number one, if not at least within the top <clears throat> 12. So they use a lot of pesticides, you know? So if you go to those you pick farms, for example, you know, out in the country in, in certain areas of the South and you go and visit them and they allow you to pick uh, strawberries, for example, be mindful that if they're not a certified organic farm, those strawberries look real beautiful and perfect because they probably had to use a lot of pesticide to prevent them from getting damaged. Now, as you work your way down the list, you start to get into what is known as the clean 15. So we can see from one to 12, you got strawberries, spinach, nectarines, apples, peaches, pears, cherries, celery, tomatoes, sweet bell peppers, and potatoes. Those were your top 12 that are in the dirty dozen. And now as you work your way down to the bottom, you can see you've got things like sweet corn, avocados, pineapples, cabbage, onions, I'd say even garlic are in that list, papayas. But now watch this, let's, let's watch how the games are played now. You know what I mean? There's always a game, y'all know that. You ain't come to Happily Natural Day just to get some basic information. So papayas, we've already determined there's a genetic modified version of those, right? Can anybody guess? I mean, there's no way for you all to really answer, but I'll just, you know, assume that if you all were to guess, you'd probably say the other GMO on this list is, and I'm gonna guess the answer is probably corn, right? Well, you are correct. There's a lot of genetically modified corn. In fact, we verified that earlier with the 10 that we identified. So if the papaya and the sweet corn are considered to be clean 15, is it because their pest resistance has been built into them genetically. That's what I want you all to do some homework on. If you, again, request a presentation, I send it to you. You'll see back at that page where we talked about some of the characteristics behind these plants. That's basically what has been happening. So you want to be very careful even about the clean 15 list because some of the things that are clean are clean due to genetic modification. But the lion's share of this list is actually plants that really don't get affected too much by pests. And so again, you think about an avocado, it's, you know, skin is very tough. Um, I'm not a grower of pineapples, so I can't tell you why they're so resistant, but for whatever reason they are. Onions, garlic, uh, any of my growers of alliums, you know, uh, not only are they uh, not necessarily needing pesticide, but they even serve as a pesticide if you do what's called companion planting. If you want to grow a garden or a farm and you plant some collard greens, you know, everybody know at some point, you know, there's going to be some bugs showing up. Or if you're in the open country, you're going to have some deer or some raccoons or other pests to come in and try and eat those. If you interspace those collard greens or the kale or that cabbage with onions or garlic, scallions, leeks, those plants actually create natural pesticide resistance to those crops. So it's no mystery that you would also see onions on the uh, Clean 15 list. So all that just means in short, even though I've gone long with the point, is that if you did not want to buy certified organic onions, you could still be pretty sure that if you bought them conventionally, they're pretty safe to eat. That's the general rule of thumb with this list. And so they actually have a card if you go onto their website, the Environmental Working Group, every year they create an updated card that you can cut out or you can print out, cut out, put it in your wallet or purse and ride with it when you go to the store. So that way you can ensure that you're able to make some good decisions about how much money you truly want to spend. Now, if you want to get certified organic, all power to you. I'm that type of shopper myself. But there are some times where it's just like, you know what, look, either I'm in a place where there's no certified organic products 
For example, if I travel to my family land in Gauls, Texas, there ain't no Whole Foods, there's no Trader Joe's or cooperatives like we have in Atlanta. So I got to go to just the regular, you know, uh, uh, Piggly Wiggly, if you will. Their organic selection is very limited. I use the Clean 15 list to guide my shopping when I'm buying my produce there. All right. So other things you can get through Environmental Working Group, just as kind of a, a plug on some of their other uh, features on their website, is you can get the same type of rating system on cleaning products. So even though I know we're talking about food today, just know that they do the same thing on the safety rating of cleaning products. Uh, they also do uh, food rates on food scores, uh, as well as cosmetic products. So again, if you're trying to get away from using a lot of chemical cosmetic products, they're able to help you evaluate more than 60,000 products. And then they even have an app. So with that being said, we're about 42 minutes into this. That actually concludes at least kind of the core of what I want to discuss. I do want to quickly plug the certified, organ uh, certified Naturally Grown, excuse me, logo, because even though I didn't include it in the presentation, I think it's very important for people to know about that certification for a couple of reasons. Let's start with the producer side. One, if you are a farmer and you're considering sustainable practices, if you're not already, a good entry into that uh, world from a certification position is to go certified naturally grown. Reason being is that it is a peer-to-peer -peer certification system. So if I'm a certified naturally grown farmer and my brother Duran wants to become one, he can come to me and I can certify him. There's no third party involved in that. Now, from a position of uh, self-sufficiency, it's pretty dope. Now, you just have to ask yourself, as a consumer, how much do I trust that these peers are truly certifying each other and not just allowing one to slip through with conventional production practices, but saying that they're naturally grown? Because the certified naturally grown practices are supposed to be exactly the same as the certified organic standards. So if you go on to the certified naturally grown's website, you will see that they say we expect all of our farmers to comply with the USDA's standards. However, because they don't have a third party certification system, you can just have people hooking each other up. I'm not saying that that happens, but I am saying that's the value of a third party verifier who doesn't have any skin in the game between this relationship. They just wanna objectively uh, be able to review the standards. Now, but here's still some of the other pros to CNG. It's much cheaper to get than to be certified organic. Um, also, you find that farmers who had farmer's markets, so any of these outdoor farmer's markets that you all may have in your local towns, hopefully you know about them. If you don't, look them up. Go support the small farmers because what you'll find is the CNG farmers are your small farmers. You know, those are the farmers that you could probably even ask them, hey, if you don't mind, could I come to your farm and even see what you're growing? And nine times out of 10, you'll find that those farmers are more than happy to have you come. Uh, just be ready for them to possibly ask you to do some work. <laughs> so if you're gonna go there and, and, and see what they're doing, then you need to also participate in it too, right? But all that being said, you'll find that a CNG logo on a farm's product gives you a good indication that they're probably a small farm and not a big 10,000 acre farm probably not even a 100 acre farm. They might only have five acres, 10 acres, 40 acres. And these are typically the farms that we really are trying to encourage support for, that small family farm versus these big mechanical farms or even these capos where they keep pigs and chickens tight together, you know, 20,000 animals deep in less than an acre. So I just wanted to plug CNG just to really encourage you all to also begin to pay attention to that logo because you're not gonna see it in your local Whole Foods you're gonna see it when you go to your local farmer's market. Um, but with that being said, if there's any questions, I don't know how you're doing this manifest. Are you taking like questions through Facebook or, or, or social media or, or how do you wanna work this? I don't even know if we're able to do a Q and A. So I, got a um, I, got my, I got my YouTube open. Okay. I got my Facebook open. And so some questions have come through. Uh, sure. Um, well, this question is a little old, but it was around the start of the presentation. Okay. Uh, so there was like uh, the, one of the questions was, uh, "What foods? If if this is if this be the case, <clears throat> what foods can you can you eat for for optimal wellness? You know what I mean? Like if you got pesticides dripping over 
the 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 the, the, the main foods that we eat all the time, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what can we eat? And then um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. another question was uh, uh, was about uh, rice. You know, they was asking okay. somebody, they didn't know what they didn't know it was a black rice. So that that was oh that yeah was, oh, oh yeah oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a black rice. It's high in aloe melanins. And shout out to Baba Wakesa Mandimoyo uh, of the Angola movement, Angolo music movement. Excuse me. If you go on to Facebook, N G O L O movement, you'll uh, learn more about what he's been talking about relative to foods high in aloe melanin. So that would be black rice, black chicken, for example. Uh, I don't mean just a chicken with black feathers. I mean, there's literally a chicken, its eyes are black. Its beak is black, its feathers are black, its feet are black. It's an entirely black chicken. Uh, and it's known to be a chicken that's actually high in aloe melanin as well as black garlic. Now black garlic is not grown black. It's actually processed into being black. It's a fermentation, if you will. But when you ferment it, it's aloe melanin increases. Well, guess what other chemical aloe melanin bonds very well with? Melanin, mm-hmm. right? So since you're high in it, If you do consume things that are high in aloe melanin, you'll find that your uptake of those nutritions is actually, uh, from what Baba Wakesa teaches, uh, able to be done so uh, at higher levels. I'm not the scientist on that. Uh, However, I will say full transparency, I've begun to uh, ferment some garlic myself. So I'm very interested in seeing the results of that fermentation. Uh, That'll be uh, in about another three weeks when that will be completed. Uh, But due to his teachings, I am very interested in seeing what effect uh, those alamelanin uptakes uh, have even in just consuming garlic within my own body. Now, going back to the question of foods that you can eat, um, and and you know, dang, what am I supposed to do? I can't eat nothing now, Tanisha. You just don't spoil my dinner, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna give the hard answer first because y'all need to hear it. Start growing your damn food. Whew. And no, my screen didn't freeze. I'm hanging a little bit. I want that to hang a little bit. Start growing y'all food, y'all. I know it's hard. I know you, oh, when am I gonna have time? Or I don't, look, I get it. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna ask you this, Manifest. You you from the era, you seen coming to America, right? Yeah. Do you have the money to get the Prince uh, Hakeem treatment? No, no, I don't, no, I don't, no, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I mean, I ain't even talking about just the, you know, hey, y'all seen the movie. I ain't talking about just the bathtub treatment. I'm talking about <laughs> roses thrown at your feet, right? Fresh juices and berries rubbed in your hair, and the <laughs> scenes we didn't see. Somebody brushing his teeth, washing his behind. You don't get to do that. You ain't got it like that. I'm sorry, y'all. So what's what's the 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 other option, you got to do it yourself, right? And if you don't take care of your hygiene, eventually you get sick. If you keep ignoring that sickness, eventually you're going to what? That's you're going to die. That's the reality of it, y'all. Now, think about that. <clears throat> you know you got to take care of all those other things. And I dare anyone to say, oh, I don't have time to brush my teeth or wash my ass. But your food, you're letting someone else control. We got to just at least know the importance of the food. I'm not saying you got to go out and farm and grow everything for yourself. So I'm not really beating you up. I just want to reevaluate food and growing your own food. Reevaluate it. So you understand just how valuable it is. The only person obligated to feed you is yourself. Not your mama, not your wife, not your husband, not your job on your lunch break. You have to feed yourself because if you don't take responsibility for that, you will die. So I just want to evaluate it high enough to say that's the hard answer. So if it encourages you to go out and grow, then I hopefully achieve something. But I know that that's a tough love type of statement. So to ease off a little bit, I'm going to say this much. Get to know your farmers that are out there. Use, again, some level of discernment about, you know, what information you get, right? That's the purpose of this presentation. How can we look at these logos and retain the healthy skepticism, but also get rid of some of the unhealthy skepticism, right? Let's dispel some of the myths. So we just don't dismiss everything, right? You do have to know a little bit about the science. 
So that's why I say, if you need the presentation, you can look at some of the breakdown on how to really evaluate USDA certified organic standards and other standards. But I'm gonna say most importantly, know your farmer and then, or most importantly, grow your own food, but secondary, begin to know your farmer or at least know the growers. So again, even if you don't have local farms around you, when you buy food from a grocery store, it's gonna tell you right there on the pack where the company is that made it. Look that company up, call them up, ask some questions. You know, is that harder than just, you know, breaking open the fork and knives and getting to eat? Yeah, it's a little bit tough, but hey, this is revolution, y'all. This is a fight. Definitely an extra step. <clears throat> yeah, but it's one that's worth making. You know, look, look, I forgot and I'd be remiss not to cut you, brother. I mean, and this ain't saying that this is what happened. But I'm saying again, knowledge, you know, comes to us in all forms. We see our good brother just transition. Chadwick just transitioned, 43, colon cancer. I don't know what his lifestyle was. I assume it's great because that brother looked very healthy. So it could have been something else, but let's just think about the part of the body that got affected, the colon. It sounds like to me, we need to take some of these extra steps to check on what's going on in our food. You know, because for all we know, like as, as healthy as I'm sure he was eating, I'm telling you, I believe he would have had to have been very healthy. This food system is crazy, y'all. So we got to take some of those extra steps if we're going to really, you know, look at this thing as what it is, which is whoever controls your food controls you, right? So take those extra steps. Don't look at the burden. Once you learn it, I'm telling you, it comes quick. I was like, y'all, you know, whoever feels like, man, this is a burden 10 years ago, but now it's just clockwork, you know? So you got to just do a little bit of the knowledge and you'll get, you'll get through it. So I got, I got a couple questions too, man. Yeah, so man. Like, <clears throat> you know, uh, I know you're a grower as well as an aggregator. Yes. And you know, the, 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 the last question, you know, about, you know, taking control of your food system, you know, we do a lot of classes, you know, we teach people about, uh, you know, plant biology, seeds and seed starting and things like that. And uh, one of the topics that we talk about are the different types of seeds. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk about GMO seeds, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, conventional seeds, we talk about hybrid seeds. And, um, you know, I, I point a lot of people in, in the direction of uh, Vandana uh, Shiva, the sister from yeah. From India, who talks a lot about this, but um, since I got you on the horn, and I, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, how accessible are GMO seeds? You know what I mean? Because if, if if the ten top ten of these crops are not super, you know, are, are are so prevalent, you know, is there a thought that we might be should be concerned about, you know, our seed purchases? Like like you know what I mean? Like if it doesn't have a certified organic label, don't buy the seeds. You know what I mean? That type of thing. Well, again, so, you know, to be, uh, to play by the book, I mean, the 10 crops are the 10 crops. That's what's commercially available. So when I used that word in the, in the quiz and I said, that's the key word, what we're just saying is those are the ones that you can physically go out and buy in any form, right? As a food product or as a production product. So even if it's not certified organic, as long as it's not any of those 10, then it shouldn't be a GMO. Now that doesn't mean though that it's not a coded seed. That doesn't mean, you know, there's like this again, and this is why these are multiple presentations we'd almost have to do. There's other things to be concerned about. Right. But just with regards to GMOs, those 10 are the 10 now, uh, you know, you know manifest. So this is hopefully a lesson to the guests if they don't already know. Open pollinated is the way to go, y'all. You mm -hmm. know, get your open pollinated heirloom seeds. What that means is that nature created that seed via the pollination process that we're trying to maintain. That's another subject, right? For another day, but with the bees, you know, having their issues, you know, pollination is not happening as often as it needs to, unless you know how to go in and do that by hand as our elder George Washington Carver used to do, right? But open pollination is what you're aiming for. Now, another Subject, which I guess this would be good. I didn't put it in the presentation, but we could talk about this is hybridization, right? Yeah. Hybridization of seeds is not genetic modification. Hybridization of seeds actually to a degree is just man-made pollination. The problem with hybridization is just that when a plant is hybrid and then you wanna save the seeds from that crop, it's not gonna maintain the 
purity of the exact crop that you currently have, as you continue to replant its seeds, it's going to go back to the different itemized seeds that were that were cross pollinated. All right. So, for example, even in open pollinated settings, I've seen where if you got a cucumber plant growing over here on the north side of the farm, you got uh, yellow squash growing on the south side. I've seen at the at the end of the season where all of a sudden those yellow squash start having the shape of yellow squash, but they take on the characteristics of what a cucumber looks like. Mm. <laughs> because you'll see the pollination of bees traveling between those two crops and they become a new crop. Now, if I kept the seed from that, let's say squelling, that's what Baba uh, Rashid calls it. That's a squelling, right? <laughs> then, and think about that, there's crops like that that you can buy in the grocery store. How many of you all have ever had, a, uh, what you call it, a, a, a pluot? I think it's what it's called. A pluot, I had one today, P-L-U-O-T. It's like, it's a, it's a plum and a, I think a, a kumquat mixed together. There's, there's two fruits that they've mixed together to create this. A lot of your fruits are like that. The way that they can continue to perpetuate that plant is they have to continue to keep um, basically like propagating the plant. They can't really start it from seed. You have to propagate it, right? Meaning you have to cut parts from a plant reroot it so that it keeps going because if you save the seeds and try and plant it the seeds are going to start to go back to no this was actually supposed to be a yellow squash it wasn't supposed to be a squelet right mm -hmm. now i'm bringing all of that up to say that hybridization isn't necessarily the the angel but it ain't the devil either uh, full transparency i used some hybrid seeds for tomatoes when covid hit why <laughs> because <laughs> Tomatoes take how long to, to produce manifest? Like 90 days. Sometimes like, yeah, 75 to 90 days. There's a hybrid variety called the early girl. You ever heard of that one manifest? I've heard of it. Produces in 45 days. So for the sake of survival, feeding my family, making sure that I just had something in the ground and it was gonna come out quick, I planted those early girls and then one month and two weeks, I had bright red tomatoes ready to go. Oh, wow. So I had to be strategic about what I was doing. Now, once I had those two plants, that's all I grew, two plants out of 20 plants. I grew two, they were hybrid. The rest of them I grew open pollinated, mm -hmm. right? So I had to like, you know, I had to, had to be strategic about that decision. Right. But open pollinated is the way to go. That's what you'll always hear an organic or, or sustainable farmer endorse. And if they don't, then I'm going to say they may not necessarily be a sustainable grower. Right. Um, one more question came through on the, uh, YouTube, man. Uh, uh, my brother, uh, Sally uh, Adeyemi, uh, hit, hit, hit up the, the, the chat on, uh, on our YouTube page. And um, he asked, how do we know that the store is being truthful when they say an avocado or any other fruit is organic? Excellent question. I would say one, it doesn't start with the store because the store is just a retailer. They just bring it in through the back, throw it on the shelf. What you want to question is the logo, which is who produced this. And remember what I said about the organic integrity database. In fact, can I share my screen again since we're on the internet? I guess that's the beauty of uh, doing these webinars. I'm gonna go to the, to the Organic Integrity Database for you all live and on the spot. <laughs> you all able to see my screen, man? I can see it, yep. Yeah. USDA Organic Integrity Database, or Organic.AMS, which stands for the Agricultural Marketing Service, .USDA, of course, United States Department of Agriculture, .gov, A-E, I-E, excuse me, the government. So let's see what the government got to say about how you can look up a product. <laughs> Boom. Now, this is just where the list starts, right? But you can filter wow. it. You can do queries. You can do a query. I can say Georgia. Come on now, I thought I, I'm typing too quick. Maybe if I just hit it, it'll query it. Yep, there we go. Boom. 
Now, if I wanted to say, ba, 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 ba. hmm, who do I know? Let me think. Gilliam. Hopefully, they're watching. If they are, shouts out to my brother Prentice and my sister Lovey. Ah, uh, maybe they don't have it under that name. Let's try one more. Uh, oh gosh, I don't know. Let's do. We'll just go back to the list. It technically doesn't matter who I pick. Let's just go back to the list. I just wanted to show some love for some black certified organic farms. If we click on 2H Farms LLC. It's going to tell me status effective, meaning when they last got certified. They last got certified on September 11th, 2019, which means their certification is coming up. They have to be certified in another two weeks, y'all. Mm. Here's, a, here's a starting point right here. Right. So now, if it is December and you're still seeing products from 2H, I ain't knocking 2H and I'm sure they ain't going to fall short on this, but if you still see products saying that they're certified organic from them, they haven't received their certification. If their certification date on here still ends up saying September 11, 2019 in December, there's a starting point for you. Right. You got their address. I mean, mm -hmm. gosh, how much more do you need? Right. <clears throat> you can literally go to the farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Product details. If we click on that. Tells you which products that they actually had in their organic systems plan. Mm -hmm. I know that that's what you call it because I'm, I didn't tell this to you all, but I've been trained to be a certified organic inspector. Though I'm not licensed, I know how to do it. Okay. Uh, I did this though as an advocacy move. This is warfare, y'all. So you I knew that there was farmers that needed to get certified organic. And instead of them learning the hard way, a certifier shows up and it's like, oh snap, I didn't have stuff together. I go to them and I say, this is what you need to make sure you have together before you call them. Mm. And then this way you don't get dinged. Cause what happens is, is if you have a certifier come out, you don't follow the rules correctly and they ding you, you have to wait three years before you can go back and get certified organic again. So I used my skills as someone who said, okay, I know that there's farmers that we don't want that to happen to them. We want them to get it right the first time. I go in and I'll consult them on the process. So all that being said, I'm not a licensed certifier, but I'm trained as one. And I know that if I go to your organic systems plan and you say corn, soybeans, wheat, yellow peas, but then on your plan, more is on there. Apples, pears, all this other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Or no, 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 let me back up. Hold on, hold on, let me back up. Let me, I'm saying this wrong. If this is what your systems plan says, corn, soybeans, wheat, yellow peas, but then in the store, you, got you sold apples, you sold cucumbers, you've sold eggplant as also certified organic. Mm. Me as an inspector, I'm going to say, well, wait a minute now. This wasn't in your systems plan. Mm. So are you trying to pass off some things that are certified organic through your certification? Because if you are, that's a violation. Now, I'm going to tell you all straight up. I wouldn't have skepticism about the organic logo because you get hit with a $10,000 fine. If what I just said happens to you, if they start finding out that you're labeling things organic that aren't organic, you're going to get hit with 10 stacks just like that. Ooh. Wow. How many people, you know, want to go through that? No. That's not really the kind of thing you want to play with. Mm -hmm. So um, but if you want to really be able to verify, this is the website to go to. And this is for, again, produce, uh, processed foods, you name it. So wherever you live in your state or wherever the product is from. So it's not even just about where you live. It's where the product is from. You can look it up right here, y'all. Nice. That's an excellent. Right. Uh, one last question. Um, sure. Um, so one of the things that I, I, I felt was a barrier was the cost to mm -hmm. uh, becoming certified organic. Mm. Like what, what can you expound a little bit about the cost that it, that it, 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 the cost barrier and how that impacts, you know, uh, particularly African-American farmers and like, mm -hmm. you know, getting, uh, uh, getting that certification. Yeah. So what I'll say, uh, let's go back to what we talked about, about C and G. If, if you hear what manifest is bringing up, you know, I, 
I explained that CNG is cheaper, right? Um, on average, I so I, I have worked with a couple of farmers in my time uh, and helping them again get certified organic. And I know that one of them that wanted to get his farm certified organic within three months from when he started, uh, he had to not only pay for the certification, but he had to expedite the certification. Like you can pay a, 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 a fee to expedite how quickly it gets done. Uh, that cost him about $1,300. Ooh. So he has to do that annually. Right. <clears throat> now he won't have to do that. He won't have to expedite it annually because that was just for him to expedite getting certified organic for the first time. Right. Um, so he did it for the first time quickly so he could get into the market during this season quickly. After that, he can pay the normal fee, which is brrr, still about $1,000. So, you know, but here's what's key. Now, I don't know if you knew this manifest uh, and you tell me if you did or you didn't. You know that there's a 75% cost share for that, right? I didn't know that. No, I didn't. I wasn't okay, there. so... So you pay, you have to pay this fee up front to get certified, right? You got to pay to play and scare money don't make none as they right. say. But if you go to your local farm service agency and we use a lot of acronyms in the ag world, y'all. So I'm probably going to say acronyms after I say the name once, the FSA office. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to FSA, you go to them and you turn in your, your certification and they Guaranteed. This ain't like you have to sign up for it or qualify for it. This is guaranteed. There's budget for it. You get reimbursed up to 75%. So if you had a thousand dollar certification fee, they'll give you back $750 every year annually. On top of that, in certain states, so I would check to see what the nonprofits are doing in your food space. Many of them have programs to where they'll also do for your first year. Uh, they'll do a 25% cost share. So then if you got a $1,000 fee, in the case of Georgia, you can go to FSA and you can get the $750 back and you can go to Georgia Organics and you can get $250 back in that first year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Every year mm -hmm. after that, you can always go back to the uh, USDA via its uh, FSA offices and get the 750 So the key is you just got to know how to flip this thing. Now, if, if I may, I'm going to go into a different subject, but it's kind of on that same lines of, of thought manifest, which is uh, for those of you all who've ever thought about starting a farm, right? There are programs that the USDA has that help you pay for some of the things that you need to get done. And most of that is done through what is known as the Natural Resources Conservation Service, also known as NRCS, another mm -hmm. acronym. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what happens is that if you go to NRCS and you say, I want to get a conservation plan, mm -hmm. they will say, okay, well, what things do you want to have in that plan? Because what they're looking for is ways to also create a conservative agricultural environment, not one that's depleting all the time. Mm -hmm. So conservative practices are using wells instead of using municipal water. Mm -hmm. using drip irrigation versus uh, a pivot irrigation system or a sprinkler right. system. Um, gosh, using high tunnels, right? So that you can uh, extend the season for a longer period of time. Uh, tree preservation for all my black people who if you got land in your family and y'all can't figure out what to do with it, but there's a whole bunch of trees growing up on it. Guess what? They got conservation programs for you. They will pay you. Mm. Say this again, they will pay you to keep mm -hmm. that land intact. So if y'all can't figure out what to do, at least get a check. <laughs> <laughs> right. There we go. At least get a check. Get Let's some go. form of reparations. I mean, geez, get it. Mm -hmm. Because in agriculture, and I'm, I'm, I gotta bring this thing back around so I don't go too far, but this is the exciting stuff. See what y'all what may not know, and we gonna go back to that first slide with Bob Ralph Page is though they don't call it reparations, in agriculture, that's the one area. That's it. One, one, one. That's the one area where we actually have some reparations money sitting there for us. They don't call it that. They call it funds for the socially disadvantaged farmers. I know you've heard that before it manifests. I have. Right, so socially disadvantaged is a term that falls within a timeline of work that we did when Ralph Page and company basically were able to get the Office of Advocacy and Outreach, which name has been changed since the 2018 Farm Bill. I can't remember what it's called now, but if you still type in that office, it'll just go to the new website. Right. 
They have a program called the 2501 program. And the 2501 program is money that was specifically earmarked when Ralph Page and company got it passed for black people. Period, point blank. If you was able to say you look like me or any shade of me, and of course, genetically, and you know, you had the swag, <laughs> uh, you were able to take advantage of certain programs to the USDA. Well, guess what happened? Because they don't talk about these things openly and many of us aren't farming, we didn't know that money was sitting there. So the government said, well, we can't just leave the money here. Not everybody's not using it up. So we're gonna broaden the category in the 2014 farm bill. All right, this money was put in place way back in the 90s, I believe, or at least the early new millennium. But when we didn't use it, they broadened the category. And instead of it being just for black folks, they now said, this money is available for socially disadvantaged farmers. Now guess what? You're still included in it. But they also open it up to veterans and they also open it up to other categories of citizens that they consider to be socially disadvantaged. Key is go look at the Office of Advocacy and Outreach, look up the 2501 program and see if there's something that you could take advantage of with regards to your land and your family, with regards to the small plots of farming. As our brother early, I forget his name, but I, I saw parts of his presentation, the brother with uh, Africulture, you know, and he was talking about how like you can get a small piece of land qualified as a farm, specifically one one thousandth, uh, no, one one hundredth of an acre. For those who want the real math, if you use one one hundredth of an acre for any agricultural activity, you can get a farm tractor number on that and then take advantage of these programs that I'm talking about, in addition to the tax benefits and so on and so forth. So all that being said, I know I'm going around in tangents. Um, I wanna bring that back around to the cost prohibitive stuff. There's programs that the USDA has to make things easier. What they weren't good at and what they deliberately tried to not tell us back in the day was that these programs exist. Now, shout out to Baba Rashid Nouri. I again would be remiss not to shout him out on this point alone because he helped with what is known as the Pigford case. And I know I'm hitting high level on a lot of points, y'all. So I'm sorry if it's going so high that you're just like, brother, I just wanted to know where I get my black rice from. But y'all need to know how this game is being played. Hopefully y'all are enjoying this though. You had the Pigford case, which many people loosely hear, which is called the black farmer lawsuit. Black farmers were actually awarded a settlement in the late nineties. And then this settlement was renewed again during the Obama administration for oppression that they had faced under the hand of the USDA. They had faced this oppression via black people going into USDA offices like FSA, even though I'm telling you to go there, I'm telling you, you gotta know what game they used to play too. FSA, NRCS, gosh, farm credit. Mm, no, not farm credit. Pro well, maybe farm credit. Uh, some of the other programs. Actually, it wouldn't be farm credit because I don't think farm credit is a part of USDA. But anyway, several of their programs, you would go in, you would fill out an application and literally you walk out the door, the, uh, <laughs> the agent is balling it up and he's just like, boop. That was literally what was happening, not figuratively. They were throwing away applications. They were telling you all oh, know that you don't qualify for these programs. So Baba Rashid Nori, an urban farmer here in Atlanta, you need to check out his book if you haven't. Uh, Guys, he's going to kick me for forgetting the name of it right now. But anyway, he's got a book he put out. It's his autobiography. Um, it's growing, growing. Uh, it's growing something. <laughs> I can run upstairs and get it if I had to, but we'll, we'll get it. Bookshelf too, bro. Like, I'm sorry, Baba. Uh, Baba, you know I love you. It, I'm reading it. It's just I'm reading the book, not the title. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, Baba Rashid used to work for the USDA. Ah. under the Clinton administration, under the one and only black secretary of ag that we had, Mike Epsey from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Mike Epsey was the think first black senator from Mississippi as well too before this appointment. But anyway, Mike Epsey was the secretary of agriculture. And I don't even know if y'all get that. That's, look, secretary of ag y'all is probably the most powerful political appointment there is underneath military appointments. Why? Because everybody got to eat. Right. And agriculture is not just food. Too often we just talk about food. It's fuels and measure, i.e. petroleum. 
It is logistics. Them ships that come in and out of the San Francisco Bay and Savannah, Georgia, and all up and down the East Coast. Secretary of Ag is in charge of that. Textiles, cotton, polyester, on and on and on. Silk, Secretary of Agriculture, and the USDA has 19 different offices. It's got one of the largest amount of offices in the US government. So Secretary of Ag is important. And we had a black man who was that politically aware black man, let me be clear, during the Clinton administration who had Rashid Nouri as one of his deputies. And what these two brothers did is worth knowing about. They said, all right, Mike Epstein said, we need to figure out what's going on with all this talk about the USDA not doing right by black people. Rashid, I need you to go and look into this. Rashid was able to solicit a black law firm here in Atlanta, and they were able to gather the data, which was known as the Miller Report. And the Miller Report was used basically as one of the key pieces of evidence in the Pigford lawsuit. So during the 1990s, when they were gathering this data, that data got used in the Pickford case in the late 90s, early new millennium. And that's what gave way to the black farmers being awarded the settlements that they got, which ranged anywhere from $50,000 up to 12 million in the case of people such as Shirley Sherrod and new communities down in Albany, Georgia. That was Rashid Nuri's work. Wow. All right. Wow. And guess what? You think they were able to keep their jobs after they exposed the very department they worked for? <laughs> No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and no. So they sacrificed themselves. They did what you're supposed to do when you go up in these jobs. Don't play around. Mm. You in there, you you know, you damn Freeman now. You know what I'm saying? You just spook you sat by the door. Go in there and get to work, man. Otherwise, if you're not going to work for the people, why are you there? So I bring all of that up to say, like, these programs now have to get right. So one of the main things you want to do is when you go to the USDA via its offices, NRCS, FSA, you need to get a receipt of service. I don't care what you go in there and ask for. If you just take a pamphlet off of the doggone bookshelf that's free, say, I want a receipt for service that I came in here and got a pamphlet. I'm serious. Go in there and make sure you get receipt of service because what happens is they didn't have that in place. So they, there was no way to even prove you walked in the office, let alone what you asked for. Now they have to write down the date, the time, your name, your farm number, if you got one, and what you came in there and specifically requested and give it to you just like a receipt if you go to any retail store. And that's one of the key mechanisms that got put in place due to the works of Ralph Page, due to the works of Rashid Nouri, uh, Mike Epsey, Jerry Pinnock, uh, uh, John Zippert, Shirley Sherrod. These are our freedom fighters in this ag world, y'all. Uh, Benjamin Burkett, we got to give them their love, yo. And now we got our new freedom fighters. We got the Leah Penniman. We've got uh, Malik Yakini, who's coming up. Big respect to Baba coming on after me. You know, like we got a lot of people doing this work, y'all. This is a political movement, and we're just asking you to be a part of it, not just as a consumer, but support us. Buy our food. Grow your own food and be a part of this work for real. Word. Word. Oh man. So this was rich. This is way more. Hey, look, you know, I, I we could go all day, you know, because I could start asking you about nature's candy and aggregation, you know, but we're not gonna go that, you know, we're not gonna go that deep today. Uh, even though I would love uh to 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 to, to do this again because I feel like we are only scratching the surface. I had a chance to meet, I had the honor of, uh, of uh, doing the uh, uh, introduction to uh, Shirley Sherrod. Uh, mm. She uh, was given an award. Baba Charles, excuse me, not to cut you, I forgot to mention Baba Charles, her husband, because he's right. actually the one who really, you know, was the idea behind a lot of the things. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I said I was, um, I was, I was, I was given the honor of introducing her, you know, but as I was digging mm -hmm. around and did the research, I was like, yo, this is the legacy. These Shirley and Charles were in SNCC. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it was like, yo. so I was like, yo, from SNCC to 2020, 
you know, and their pivot from that whole conversation, it reminded me of Fannie Lou Hamer, who went on to do the, the uh, Freedom Farms Cooperative. Shit. That's and right. Went on and, 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 and delved into the farming. And it made me also remind, reminded me of um, the Republic of New Africa and how they mm -hmm. were trying to access land. It's like every, the evolution of the civil rights movement to the Black Liberation Movement was a conversation and a deliberate mm -hmm. work towards acquiring land. See that marriage, my brother? You see, we didn't, a lot of us didn't put the two together. We didn't see the connection. Nope, nope, nope. But that's the I mean, if, we have hey, here. if we may, I mean, it's it's 7.50. How long we got? Because, look, you want to go, go. We, got, we got 10 minutes to tell Baba Yakini come up on this joke. I know he's going to take him home. 10 minutes. Let me take him home. Let's go into what you just talked about. First and foremost, yes, this food work has always been revolutionary, y'all. This ain't something that just started. Right. Like you said, Fannie Lou Hamer. Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver. These are revolutionaries. Now watch this now. Let's start with the Civil War. The Civil War was one of the biggest brain drains in American history. Mm -hmm. Meaning people went to war and they got killed. That was a brain drain. Mm -hmm. Not like the brain drains in Africa where they travel out of Africa and come over here and make all their money and never go back, right. <laughs> you know? Right. I'm talking about the brain drains where like literally people were slaughtered. Mm -hmm. And so the U.S. government in 1862 created the Merrill Act, right? By way of Congressman Merrill, so. or Senator Merrill, which one, whichever one he was. Uh, Merrill, a white uh, congressman, passed the 1862 Merrill Act, which gave birth to the land grant institutions. Now, this was the white land grant institutions. So remember, 1862. Right. Emancipation right. hadn't even happened yet. So, Texas AM, what would be in Virginia? Uh, uh, Virginia would that be VP? Um, or would that be Virginia? The, uh, so, Virginia, so, Virginia, you had the, the moral, uh, the land grant institutions were Virginia Tech was mm -hmm. the first one. And then it was uh, uh, Virginia State College for Negroes or whatever. That was. Now, later okay. on, I'm Virginia, Virginia State University. But your 1862 is Virginia State and Virginia Tech then? Yeah. I think Virginia okay. Tech was before, but, I, but, I, but I'm not sure which one. I know Virginia Tech came before Virginia State. Virginia, but, gotcha. Okay. So, but your Merrill Act is what basically created those types of schools. U University of Georgia, University of Florida, Texas A&M, okay. University of Tennessee. These are all ag schools, y'all. So... 1862, you and I couldn't go to them schools. Right. But in 1890, they had the second Merrill Act, which gave birth to the HBCU system, right? Mm -hmm. So now that is the FAMUs, that is the Florida, uh, excuse me, um, Fort Valley states. Uh, that would be Alcorn State, uh, 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 Prairie View, you know, Alabama, A&M. But guess what? Somebody was doing some work between 1862 and 1890. Who was that? Tuskegee University, i.e. Tuskegee Let's Institute go. at that time. Let's go. <laughs> 1881, 1881, 1881. Mm. Our people said, you know what? Let's just, let's just go to the statue. If you've never seen the statue in front of Tuskegee Institute, y'all, in the courtyard, it's Booker T pulling the veil off of a man's eyes who was a slave. He's standing above him, right? Mm -hmm. He's standing above this dude. And he's like, you know what? Open your eyes so you can see. Mm -hmm. He lifted the veil off of his eyes. Mm -hmm. And his whole thing was, you are the answer to your problem. You are the one who's going to solve your problems. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is going to do it for you. And so Within the ag world, of course, he hires George Washington Carver, the greatest scientist that ever lived in the United States. George Washington Carver created what was called the Jessup Wagon. Right. Why was the Jessup Wagon created? It was a wagon that drove around the community to teach people the skills of agriculture because they knew what? Even though we got our own school, not all of our people can come to our school. Right. Right. Yeah, they can't go to the 1862, but they all can't come to us because they work in the fields. They got to work their farms. Exactly. May not be able to afford it, whatever the case may be. So we're going to go to them. We didn't forget about them. We don't leave them hanging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. HBCUs. I'm gonna call you out because I'm an HBCU product. Right. Right. We're gonna be up in some of these communities, but not go back and reach out to the community. Come on now. Right. Straight up. So 1881, they go to the community. Well, not 1881, but within their 1881 right. system, if you will, they went to the community with the Jessup wagon. And eventually that Jessup wagon created the template for the cooperative extension service. Mm. Because the USDA saw what was going on and they said, well, you know what? We want to replicate this nationwide. Mm. So can we use the model that you all are using with the Jessup wagon, which eventually was called the Booker T. Washington Mobile School. Mm. And they said, we want to create this thing called cooperative extension. Well, guess what? The first cooperative extension agent was Thomas Monroe Campbell, who was the understudy to George Washington Carver. So even the Cooperative Extension Service, y'all better go get them resources because that's yours. No different than when they took the free breakfast program and made that a government thing that now you can't even get if your child was getting it going to school, right? That was ours through the Black Panthers. But we always provided solutions for ourselves. And so this is, again, what's happening in this day and time. We're seeing our freedom fighters saying, you know what? Enough is enough, Mm -hmm. you know? We gonna do it for ourselves, And so that's what inspired Nature's Candy Farms to get into the garden production for people, going to the homes and saying, look, if you can't afford to get the organic food as the question was asked earlier, if you can't afford time to come to a, a farmer's market, I can teach you how to grow it yourself. Right. So I do that work in the spirit of Tuskegee Institute, man. And last point, what was the famous crop that George Washington Carver, of course, is most notable for mastering? All right, peanuts. Now, why don't we run the peanut industry? Ain't that a ain't that a bleep? That's a bleep. We don't run that industry. But I talked about a crop that I'm growing and that me and Baba Wakesa are working on. So uh, we look into maybe seize a market, man. We need to seize some of these crops, Daron, and, and anybody else on the call, even Baba Malik just showed up, you know. We, right. we keeping it red, black, and, and unapologetically green, as you would say, Baba, like this is uh, the moment that we're in right now. Let's find the crops that we corner the market on, that right. we know everything about that crop from the seed to the table that no one can get the information on unless they come through us. Mm-hmm. And let's corner those crops, mm-hmm. you know, because Welch's is a cooperative. And so that means they understand their fruits. Ocean Spay is a cooperative. Land Lakes is a dairy cooperative. You got Organic Valley. Let's form our own cooperatives and master some crops, my people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to be a very solid move from an economic development standpoint as we move forward. So, my brother, thank you for having me, man. This was magnificent, my bro. I am so excited, man. This is making this. Thank you so much for uh, spending time with us today, man, and, 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 and really digging in with both hands. You know what I mean? In terms of this topic, man, what is organic is, you know, as you know, as we've already discoursed about, is way bigger than just that label, you know. What I'm right. and it, it's touching on so many different aspects, and um, you know, man, you did a masterful job of weaving these different uh, themes together. Uh, I'm praying that the people that have t- tuned in were taking notes, and uh, just for uh, reinforcement, how do they get in contact with you? Uh, yeah. post, uh, the, uh, the the festival. Nature's Candy Farms at gmail.com. N a t u r e s C-A-N-D-Y-F-A-R-M-S at gmail.com. Um, and then that way, if you want the presentation or if you got any questions, uh, just make the heading clear enough because I ain't gonna lie, boy, I get a lot of emails. So <laughs> make the heading clear so I don't delete you. And uh, I got you, you know what I mean? Like I said, for those who want their seeds, I'm gonna send you a couple of packs. Send me your uh, information through the email and I'll shoot those out to you. Sweet man, and, uh, and I think you, you, you have me, you having me come on after Baba, right, and, and get down on yeah, the ones and twos, so, right? Look, they do notice, like, right? If y'all got if y'all got some good energy right now, bro, like uh, after we finish with Baba Yakiti, we gonna hey, talk look, about I was in the studio. Maybe y'all ain't know I was in the studio, so <laughs> we got to warm it up. You know, the vi- the vinyl is on deck. You know what I yeah, mean? So we gonna have a little wind up, wind up. We ain't winding down. We gonna wind it up. After uh, <laughs> after we finish with uh, uh, Bobby Yukini, uh, with yeah. uh, Third World, uh, uh, Brother Tanisio is gonna get on the wheels of steel uh, with us, and uh, you know, let's get festive, man. This is uh, you know, we need some time to release, man. This has been an amazing. Yeah,
year, you know what I mean? And the summer intense has been intense. So like, you know, let's let's close out the we're gonna close out the festival with some tunes. Uh. And just we, we thank you, brother. We thank you, man. This is your work, man. 18 years dedicated, man. Y'all better make sure y'all give this brother his flowers every day while he's on this planet. Don't wait for Duran to leave us, yo. Yes, you did your work, man. So big respect, comrade. Man, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. We'll be in yeah, touch. Man. Talk to you a little bit later, man. We'll follow up after it's all said and done. All right, peace. Baba Ye Malik Yakini is in the house. You're now tuned into the 18th and you will happily natural day. We are at eight o'clock and I'm ecstatic. I'm bubbling over with energy right now. I'm super hyped because this has been phenomenal. This has been an amazing day. I mean, from 11 o'clock when we turned on the libations, you know, to eight o'clock now, we've had nothing but spectacular intellect sharing some very personal